let me start by saying that the first two or three people that came in the room today filled me in on things that I didn't know about the 60s. So note my email address here, and if you're one of those that has some information that I left out, please let me know. I'm optimistically hoping that someday there might be a reprint and we can get that information in, but you never know. So as Julie said, I was a graduate of the university in 1970. I found my way out to Silicon Valley, uh, spent most of my adult career working for Cisco and, and Apple Computer. Uh, after I retired, I was accepted into the graduate program at San Jose University, San Jose State, where in 2016 I uh, earned a master's degree in history. And after reading and studying history for a few years, I, I thought I'd try my hand at writing some. Uh, you, you may be aware, I'm sure you're aware, that there's a large body of literature on the 60s. Much of it focused on the, the large centers of activism, University of California, Berkeley, Columbia, Madison, but there are also histories written about uh, uh, secondary schools, such as Indiana University, and there's several histories written on Southern Illinois University, believe it or not, but nothing about the University of Illinois. And this seemed like a, 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 a real omission to me. Uh, I, I felt like ours was a story that deserved to be told, and um, uh, in a sense, it was a microcosm of the, of the national story at the time. Now, there was lots going on in the 60s. Uh, the, uh, it was the time when, when the meme, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll was first coined. But this is not that story. The, the widespread use of marijuana, uh, hallucinogenics, uh, easy access to the birth control pill, the, the music, these were all really important components. They, they form a background for this story here. But this is a political story. This is a story of a minority of a generation standing up in opposition to what they felt were the mistakes of the majority. It's, um, it's a story of, of, of some heroism and courage, but also of idealism and not a small amount of naivete at the time. But it's also a story that did not end particularly well, either at Illinois or in the nation as a whole. This picture was taken in May 1970. It is uh, the last semester of the final school year of the 1960s decade. It's a couple thousand students at the Union facing off against Illinois State Troopers, National Guardsmen, local police. The campus is in chaos at this time. Out-of-town radicals have taken the stage at Gregory Hall, calling for revolution, telling students to pick up guns. Firebombs were found in Lincoln Hall, Alkill Hall, Harker Hall. The armory was bombed. The Champaign Federal Building was bombed. A military recruiting station in Urbana was burned to the ground. Students were in the streets throwing rocks, attacking police, breaking windows, defying authorities on all sides. The DI described it this way. Nobody is in charge. The president and chancellor are ignored by all. They blamed men fat with power, who deplore a violence rather than embracing justice, who send troops to preserve the peace rather than making troops unnecessary smashing the skulls of their students to preserve the property and rights of businessmen. for one second and turn the mic towards you and turn it up a little bit. We're, we're having a hard time hearing in the back. Okay. Okay. Let's see if we can go that high without it popping. That, that's your volume dial. If, you, if, you, if it pops, you'll move that up. Uh, if it pops, I will yep. turn the dial. Yep. You hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So the question is, how the heck did this happen? Uh, here, of all places. It's such a conservative place, the University of Illinois. That's what we're going to look at here. That's what I looked at in the book. Uh, I'll walk you through what I saw as three phases of the student movement that preceded this image you see here. Let's start with, uh, with a look at the background. The, the students of the 60s grew up in a time of complacency and conservatism. Dwight Eisenhower was the president. 
It was an explosive time of growth for the middle class. It was good times. It was a post-war economic boom as well as a demographic baby boom. Anti-communism, Red Scare was in the air. In the first year of the decade, 1960s, the conformity was on display with this fellow in the lower left here, Leo Koch, was an assistant biology professor at the university, wrote a letter to the DI suggesting that premarital sex might be okay for mature students. Not for immature students, just the mature students. Oh, the, the microphone, okay, thank you. I'm te I'll be tethered here. Uh, he was fired immediately for expressing such uh, radical thoughts. Uh, the fellow to his right, Edward Yellen, was a TA, teaching assistant in the physics department. As a youth, he had been a member of a, a communist youth organization and disavowed that. But as a graduate student, TA in physics, he was called before the House on Un-American Activities, asked to name names of his fellows in the youth organization. He declined to do that and was immediately suspended by the university. However, in his case, his, his department and his department head rallied around him and he was allowed to, to stay in school, uh, maintain his position and maintain, most importantly, his fellowship. Now to get a, a sense of the students at the time, uh, check out this, uh, this brochure on the right hand side here, this welcome to the university brochure from uh, 1965. It gives you a strong sense of conformity. First off, you notice uh, there are, there's nobody of color in the picture. It's all white faces. Secondly, uh, it's male dominated, two to one male, accurately reflecting the, the student population at the time. And they're even dressed alike. All the guys are wearing uh, sweaters with button down collars and, and the women are wearing knee length skirts mostly. It gives you a sense of, uh, of, of, of the conformity of the era. Uh, these, were, these were students of privilege. These were white students of privilege, uh, children of middle class prosperity. Uh, these were the students that the 60s protest movement came from. Now during their high school years, one story dominated the news, and that was the civil rights movement. It was an, an, an historic precedent to the 60s student movement. It was started in the 50s, started in the South, but it was the primary news story that dominated the media through the late 50s and, and early 60s. It was about desegregation of schools, businesses, lunch counters, voter registration, the fight for Americans of color to gain the right to vote. It, it importantly introduced a number of tactics to the students, sit-ins, marches, pickets, they learned this from the nightly news shows where they watched it. Now, these protests were quite violent. Uh, protesters were beaten, fire hosed, attack dogs were turned on them, some were murdered. Again, there was no internet, so it's all playing out on the three nightly news channels that were the only way to get your news back in the day. Let's take a quick look at some of the relevant personalities on the Illinois campus here. Upper left, we have President George Stoddard, was uh, named president in 1947. He was a, a, an odd choice. He was an Easterner, quite a liberal man, uh, founder of UNESCO, an internationalist, if you will. Not at all a good fit for uh, the conservative university. He uh, got in a fight with the state legislature over loyalty oaths, which were uh, to be required back in that time. And he was fired in 1953 over tensions with the Board of Trustees, a number of different issues. He was, after a couple years of interim presidency, he was replaced by David Dawes Henry in the lower left. Again, uh, an odd choice. He was an Eastern liberal, uh, but he had the talent to get along with the Board of Trustees and the legislature marvelously. He did that uh, very well. Uh, but once the student movement started ramping up in the mid-60s, he saw what was coming and quickly decided to name a chancellor position between him and the students on the Urbana campus. Hence, uh, Jack W. Peltison, poli sci professor in Urbana, was named to that position. And Peltison became the face of the administration throughout the 60s. 
Now on the right we have three of the activist leaders of the time. Top is a fellow named Victor Berkey, came from the University of California at Berkeley. He was president of Students for Democratic Society, uh, the more, uh, one of the more dominant uh, uh, campus groups. In the center, we have Vern Fine, who's here with us today. Vern was a founder of the Committee to End the War in Vietnam, a student and faculty committee of the time. And in the lower right, we have Phil Durrett, who was president of the Young Socialists and also associated with uh, SDS and, and the committee. Everybody was kind of intermingled back in that day. Now let's, let's take a look at the three phases of the movement. I'll start with the first, in the early to mid 60s, it was about free speech. There was this law called the Claybaugh Act, sponsored by Charles Claybaugh, state representative from uh, Champaign, pushed through the, the state legislature in 1947, stayed on the books for 20 years. It was, uh, it prohibited the use of University of Illinois resources, no other universities in the, in the state, just the University of Illinois resources by use of any seditious, subversive, or un-American groups. Claybaugh had a particular concern about communist influence, remember this is the Red Scare era, uh, at the University of Illinois. He was less concerned about other places. Uh, like I said, the book, uh, or the law stayed on the, on the books for 20 years, but in 1966, a student and employee of Willard Airport formed what he called the W.E.B. Du Bois Club. That's Du Bois in Illinois, not Du Bois in France. Uh, and uh, uh, applied for university recognition for his club. His intent was specifically and publicly to challenge the, the Claybaugh Act. Well, it threw the, the administration into a bit of a consternation, didn't quite know what to do with it. They studied the issue for quite a while, and uh, after, after study, uh, President Henry decided to to kick it upstairs to the Board of Trustees and let them decide. Uh, the board happened to be made up of uh, somewhat liberal Democrats at that time. Uh, they looked it over and said, we'll approve that. Uh, go ahead and let them uh, have their club on campus. Doesn't seem to be a, uh, an un-American uh, subversive uh, club, on, on the surface at least. But uh, a few months later, there was an election. Uh, more Republicans got on the, on the, the board back in that day. Uh, they were elected, uh, not appointed. And uh, the new board rescinded that decision and said, uh, no, we're not going to have uh, one of these uh, un-American-like clubs on, uh, on, on, on our campus. Um, students uh, reacted to this by forming an organization called SACA for Students Against the Claybaugh Act. Uh, started having rallies on the quad, that sort of thing. Uh, that, that morphed into a more general Students for Free Speech organization at the time and culminated with the appearance, the invitation by SFS, and the appearance on the quad by this gentleman in the lower right here, Louis Diskin, an avowed member of the Communist Party of the United States of America. I mean, this was a shocking thing, to have a real live communist on, uh, on, on the quad speaking to thousands of people. Uh, it was a big deal. Um, turned out he didn't have horns. Uh, he liked baseball. It, it was very anticlimactic. Very few people uh, remembered much about his speech, but the fact that a real live communist would show up on the, on the quad and be allowed to speak was, was quite out of the ordinary at the time. So as, um, as, as the years went on, uh, as the year went on, this is 1967 we're talking about, he, he showed up on March in the spring. As the year went on, you, you started to see this evolution from free speech, focus on free speech, to more of an anti-war focus. This was uh, stimulated by President Johnson's escalation of the war. You're probably aware that eventually over three million Americans served in Vietnam, men and women, over 50,000 died. In order to support those numbers, they had to ramp up the draft. The draft was uh, literally an existential threat to young men, students at the time. Uh, if you didn't go to college, you were very likely to find yourself in Vietnam. If you dropped out of college or flunked out, you very likely would find your way on, 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 onto the, 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 the front. Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, became a major player at that time. The Committee to End the War ramped up in, in size. And the Draft Resisters Union, probably the, the more radical, the most radical of the, um, 
of the three uh, was, was founded and started at that time. These, uh, these gentlemen on the, on the cover of the book in the, in the lower picture here, Steve Schmidt and uh, Rick Soderstrom, are burning their cards on the back porch of the Illini Union. It was a federal crime at the time. I mean, this, this wasn't just a, an insignificant protest. Soderstrom ended up uh, uh, escaping to Canada and spent his entire adult life as an expat in Canada. Uh, Schmidt was sentenced to two years in jail and served nine months in a federal prison before the, the law was overturned. But the back porch of the Illini Union was kind of ground zero at the time for rallies, speeches, teach-ins, pray-ins, gripe-ins, you name it. This phase of the, of the war, I would suggest, culminated in the fall of 1967 when Dow Chemical Corporation came to campus. Dow was known for two things back in the day. It was known for the manufacture of napalm, a highly flammable incendiary weapon used in the Vietnam War. And it was also quite well known for recruiting employees, graduates, on campuses. Wherever they went, there was usually some sort of protest. And Early October, they showed up at Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, about 200 students conducted a sit-in, blocking and preventing the, uh, the interviews from taking place. The new president of the University of, Cal of, of Wisconsin at the time, somewhat inexperienced in administration, decided to default what to do about it to the local police who went in, uh, began dragging students out of the building dragging him down the stairs, students fought back. First thing you know, you've got uh, uh, a police riot. Dozens ended up in the hospital. Well, President Henry and uh, Chancellor Peltison watched and read what was going on in Madison, and they reacted very differently on October 25th, I think was the date, when Dow was scheduled to appear on campus, set up uh, uh, interviews in the East Chemistry Building on campus, and about 200 U of I students decided to conduct a sit-in and block the interviews. Uh, the administration at the U of I took a step back and just let it happen quite, quite wisely. Uh, no violence. The, uh, the students uh, sat in for a few hours. The interviews were, uh, were, were stopped cold. Uh, they, they marched out singing, we shall overcome, and felt like, uh, I'm sure, the a major victory had been conducted. Well, there were months of, of disciplinary hearings uh, going back and forth. Law professors volunteered to defend lots of arguments about what is due process and these kinds of things. The, the disciplinary system at the university was, was ready for kids cheating on exams or panty raids and that sort of thing. This was just outside the realm. It, you see a history year after year of the university trying to catch up with, with the tactics that the students would, would try. Every, every, almost every year there was an announcement of a new committee to revise the, uh, the disciplinary hearings and the procedures uh, never really caught up uh, well. But uh, in this case, uh, after a few months, there was relatively minor punishment of conduct probation passed out to the students. I think of this as the, the high point of the peaceful student movement at the University of Illinois. But speaking of peace, there's one element of the 60s that's critical to understanding the period, and that is that these were violent times. This was a violent decade. A president of the United States is assassinated in 63, 65, Malcolm X is murdered, 68, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy are assassinated. Many years in the decade, there were riots in major cities, cities on fire, tanks and troops, sniping going on. Uh, on every evening, you would see TV displays of the Vietnam War with soldiers in body bags, coffins returning to the United States. Body counts were announced daily. This was something I'd forgotten about. But at the end of the newscast, the six o'clock newscast every day, you'd see a body count listed. How many Vietnamese killed? How many Americans killed? As if it's a bas it was almost like a, as if it was a basketball score. We don't see those kinds of things anymore. Uh, the Pentagon has, has gotten wiser about, about that sort of thing. Black revolutionaries were, were taking up guns, speaking in violent terms. Police violence against blacks, murders of, uh, of Black Panthers were in the news on a regular basis. But 
Throughout this time, there was little or no violence directed toward the white college students of the student protest movement. That was to change. And the change came in the summer of 1968 with the Democratic Convention in Chicago. Now, 68 was a historic year. I'm sure most of you remember it. Started with the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, overrunning towns and, and villages, putting the lie to Johnson's hopes for an early success in Vietnam. For the first time, a sitting president was challenged by a member of his own party. Johnson withdrew, handed off the baton to his vice president, Hubert Humphrey, who carried forward the war message, slightly modified. Martin Luther King is murdered in April. Two months later, June, Robert Kennedy is murdered. From an electoral point of view, with Kennedy's murder, there's no place for the student protest movement to go. It's hit a dead end. There really is no serious candidate willing to carry forward the anti the anti-war message, there's, there's this growing frustration of the youth that is uh, juxtaposed with the growing anger and frustration of the authorities. As, the, as, the, as the, the, the protest movement of the youth got larger, the anger and the frustration of the establishment grew equally. It came to head on the streets of Chicago at the convention where the authorities wanted nothing more than a peaceful, quiet convention. And at the same time, the thousands of students gathered wanted their right to be heard. The reaction was, uh, the result was a, a multi-day televised police riot, evening, uh, evening news. For the first time, violence was directed toward the white, privileged, middle-class students who made up the, the student protest movement. The reaction was huge on both sides. We entered the third phase of the student movement, I characterize as, as the violent time, the violent phase. So the country's polarizing to an extreme. Both sides become passionate. Emotional, hardened in their point of view. Nixon wins in, in, in November. It's a, it's a victory for the, the silent majority, the hard hats as they were called at the time, supporters of the war. The student movement sees this gradual shift from an anti-war movement to an attitude of anti-establishment, lumping together all authority figures from local police to, to university administrators to Nixon and, and, and his administration. The Students for Democratic Society sort of implodes. The most violent of, uh, the most extreme of the group formed a faction known as the Weathermen. They came down to, to Greg Hall, uh, announced a declaration of war on the United States of America and attempted to recruit Illini students to that war. The denouement, the climax, came at Illinois in the, that final semester of the final school year after Nixon's invasion of Cambodia, the murder of students protesting at Kent State, and the killing, local killing of a young black man named Edgar Holtz, who was shot in the back by Champaign police in the north end of Urbana after a high-speed chase. This was followed, these all these things that I just said happened in about a two week time frame. It was just like one more, one thing after another, after another, your head. I think I've got a quote in the book, something like, our heads were spinning. You didn't know whether to focus on the invasion or, or Holt's killing or, or the murdered students at protesters. Uh, it, was, it was just too much. Uh, this led to a successful student strike on the campus, part of a nation nationwide student strike one and only significant student strike in American history, followed locally by riots and the scene with which I open this discussion. Now there are, there are two aspects of the student protest movement that, that need to be touched on. Uh, from our point of view today, they are, they are worth interest. To repeat, this was a movement of largely middle class, largely white students, largely dominated by male leadership. So let's talk for a moment about, about blacks at the time and women at the time. So simultaneously with the, with the student protest movement on the campus, there was a black power movement that was growing 
on campus. It was, it was in a sense a, a parallel universe almost. It, it overlapped in many issues, it overlapped in time, but it was still quite separate with some amount of tension between the black activists and the white activists. It, this movement came out of the, the civil rights movement and a, a nationwide black power movement that was underway. The Black Student Association was, was founded on, on campus in the mid 60s. After the death of Martin Luther King, the BSA urged increased minority enrollment. Peltison and Henry seized upon this opportunity, championed it, which resulted in the Project 500, which certainly had its ups and downs, uh, but looking at it from, a, from the historical perspective was a remarkable and, and noteworthy attempt by the University of Illinois to recruit uh, a large number of lower socioeconomic students from, from large cities uh, to, uh, to make the, the, the campus more diverse. There's a, there's a book by a woman named Joy Williamson, Black Power on Campus. She was a doctoral student here at Illinois, and now she's a professor at, at Wisconsin. I recommend to you, it's a great book. Joy was helpful to me in, in my writing, and, and she explores the, 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 the black power movement on campus in, in significant degree. Now the second aspect that, that must be spoken of is the position of women in the student protest movement. We have to remember, you know, as a history student, I learned this concept of presentism, which is using today's standards to judge Thomas Jefferson for having slaves or George Washington for what he did, using uh, today's standards to, to, to judge people. So we have to remember that the 60s student movement was a product of its time. It reflected the gender standards, the, the, the male-female relationships of the time. Yet at the same time, these students were challenging uh, establishment standards on all sides. Now, women participated in the student movement in quite significant numbers. In fact, I did a little analysis to show that th there was a larger percentage of women participating in the student protest movement at Illinois uh, than, in the, than in the campus as a whole. But they were treated as second-class citizens. They were, uh, roles were largely, their roles were largely in support staff to the men. They ran the mimeograph machines, they passed out flyers. All the leaders of all the, virtually all the organizations were white males. At, as in the society as a whole, the women were harassed, sexually exploited at times. Uh, one remarkable exception to this state of affairs is the woman on the right here, Patsy Parker, who was elected the first Big Ten student body woman president in the history of the Big Ten at here, right here at Illinois. She was elected in 1960, the spring of 1967 and served in the following 67-68 school year. But it wasn't until the final years of the decade did signs of the coming women's movement of the, of the 70s and 80s begin to take hold on campus here. And I, I, don't, mean, I don't mean to say that there, was, there wasn't anything going on. If, if you look closely, there was an underground newspaper called The Walrus at the time. If you examine the, the archives, there were stories about gay rights. There were stories of women's liberation. But they weren't in the mainstream. They were still on the edge. They were, they were yet to be thought of as, as uh, the core story. So let me wrap this up now, and we'll get into some questions. But uh, what can we take away from, from this after all is said and done? First, I would suggest that we give credit where credit is due. These were young people, kids, young adults, who accomplished an extraordinary feat. They led a fight to end what many consider an immoral and unjust war. That fight was eventually won. This is a big deal. I, 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 they should be recognized. I've often thought that a statue or a memorial would not be inappropriate, perhaps even here on the U of I campus. Um, I think of them in the great American activist tradition of abolitionists and suffragettes and populism and progressivism and the labor movement. But, Despite the fact that they ended the war, in, in, in my humble opinion, they did not fundamentally change the power structure in the United States. They failed miserably at that. And that was, 
the idealistic intent at the time. The movement unleashed energy for a lot of social change, environmentalism, feminism, minority rights, LBGTQ, etc. But the 60s activists did not succeed at bringing about fundamental political change that they'd hoped for. In fact, an argument can be made that the reaction, the backlash to the 60s helped contribute significantly to the half century of reactionary conservative times that we've, many of us have lived our adult lives in. Now as a final takeaway, I would ask you to remember that this took place when it was completely unexpected, a time of complacency, conformity, conservatism coming out of the Eisenhower years. Nobody expected this. It was a shock to the nation. It's a small percentage of a generation standing up in opposition, facing a moral challenge, and standing up in opposition to the majority. If such a completely unexpected movement could happen in such a place as the University of Illinois when this happened, I would suggest that it could happen again, anytime, any place. So that's just a summary of uh, what I spent a couple of years working on with the book. I, I hope you get a chance to read the book and, and go through the, the details of it because it's, it's, it's a story that deserves to be told and it's a story about us, the Illini, the University of Illinois. So I'll leave it there and open it up for questions now. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. You bet. Um, another difference, I think, has to do with uh, surveillance by the government. So in those days, uh, it would require a, an FBI man with a camera or uh, possibly a, a surreptitious recorder. But nowadays, uh, we're probably being reported all over the place through surveillance cameras. Uh, electronics are so cheap. It seems like the government has a much better chance of nipping things like this in the bud than they would have at that time. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, good question. I, I, I thought about it a lot. In, in fact, I, I think that that had some motivation in me uh, uh, writing this book. You know, you, you, you get to my age and you, you know, you're retired and you got a lot of time in your hands, so you start scratching your head saying, what the hell just happened? How, how did we get here to where we are today? So. Uh, I'll, you, you, you raised a number of questions. I'll try to unpack them here. I think that what happened from the 70s going forward has been a story worth telling in its own right. I think that, I don't know how much the reaction to the 60s had to do with it, but I think that we've lived in a, an era, some people call it the neoliberal era, from the 70s to, to, till today when, you know, the characteristics of government for the wealthy and government for corporations and cutbacks in welfare and education and all the social spending, those characteristics have been going on since the 70s till today. A part of that is privatization of public assets. Um, Richard Nixon wasn't smart enough to figure out, to look ahead and figure that out, but he implemented the first of that privatization with a private army. There was no more draft after, after Nixon abolished it, I think maybe in the early 80s or no, it would have been uh, in the early 70s, excuse me. And um, uh, I, I stumbled upon this recently. There's a fellow named Milton Friedman who is an uh, economic uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, an ultimate right winger, if you will, uh, who uh, uh, forms part of the intellectual core of this neoliberal era uh, that, I, that I mentioned. Uh, I was at Stanford University looking at a, a historical poster on the wall. Friedman was at Stanford 
uh, had a sabbatical, he was from the University of Chicago, he had a sabbatical at, at um, Stanford where he worked with a number of people to put this proposal for uh, uh, a professional army uh, together and put it on, on Nixon's desk. Nixon uh, uh, see, thought it seemed like a good idea and here we are. Uh, since then, with as best as I can tell, not a significant uh, anti-war protest of, of much uh, weight happening on campuses since then. So, so I, uh, the short answer is uh, they did away with the draft as part of this privatization of public assets, but the larger, the larger picture is that the, the, the era that we've been living in has been about privatization of public assets and a government for the rich and a government for the corporations. Uh, and it worked. It worked. Here we are today. Uh, the surveillance cameras, boy. Um, I, I, I'm fascinated with China, what's going on there. You know, I worked for Cisco Systems, and, and uh, for a long time, Cisco was spent a lot of time uh, and money selling stuff to, uh, to China until, until they got caught hand in hand with uh, the CIA putting back doors into the, the Chinese equipment that they were selling. Chinese business uh, went off the cliff, but I visited China a number of times and, and have spent some time studying it. What's going on in there is, is extraordinary. It's, it's Orwellian to the ultimate uh, with the number of surveillance cameras and um, uh, know about the social credit system in China? Fascinating stuff. The social credit system. Uh, I, won't, I won't go into it, but it, it's a way of tracking uh, great details of information about every Chinese citizen, and they're doing it. It's succeeding. It's working quite well. It's the world's largest IT project. Um, but you're asking about the U.S. and if that is an influence here. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know enough about uh, the motivation of students today. I just know that we've got ourselves into a terrible fix. And I, but I do believe in the, the pendulum of history. I, I believe that we've swung the pendulum in an extreme right now, and it's bound to swing back. Hopefully in my lifetime, I'd like to see some of it. But uh, it'll swing back. Yes, sir. Um, just a, a little detail on, on the talk, and I, I page two of the section of your book, but on a broader image, we stopped the war but didn't fundamentally change the structure. I go to Chomsky, who says that the Vietnam War was a limited victory for the U.S. in the sense that it prevented an independent right. development, a nationalist movement, which it was, actually. They weren't going to be a block of China. They hated the Chinese. Right. But the detail that I wanted to ask about was you characterized uh, the uh, weathermen coming to, and declaring war, uh, and I think that's, I'm, I don't have a brief for them. I think the strategy was wrong, but they declared <coughs> days of rage, right? Which involved. Uh, no, actually, actually, they published an announcement of declaration of war on the United States of America. Oh, it was a formal, oh, okay. quite a, just an it, amazing I didn't see thing. It <laughs> No. Exact, exact terms. That came from uh, Bernadine Dorn, uh, Michael Lansky, and Mark Rudd, who were the leaders of the uh, Weatherman faction at the time. Well, Bernadine's doing great work in Chicago. Anyway, thank you. Any other questions? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Hello, Bernadine. I'm doing okay. Can I speak to? I'm sorry. To the, amp to the way the media was amplifying and dampening stories in the 60s compared to today, uh, especially on a local level. Well, that's a, that's a big question. Um, it was a world of difference in terms of the media. I, I, I touched on ABC, CBS, NBC, the three television networks. That's all we had. That's, that's the sum total, you know, you had AM radio and that sort of thing, but the sum total of, and, and the newspapers, of course, but television was, was at its peak in terms of influence then. Um, and it was filtered quite closely. You know, they all reported the same thing. None of them were, were out of the norm or out of the ordinary. Uh, and um, the, the, the big liberal voices, New York Times, Washington Post, very much supported the government for a long time. I was never, I'm sure that there must have been some change, but I, I went back through the New York Times and I could not find any point when they turned against the Vietnam War. As late as 69 and 70, they were editorializing. They editorialized against the student strike. So, so the, what we think of as the liberal media of today very much was, was supportive of the government line back then and, and the, the network news shows very much were. Now you fast forward to, to today, it's, it's like comparing an ant to a tank. <laughs> 
you know, uh, what we've got today with the internet and, um, uh, you know, the, the bubbles that we all find ourselves in and um, the, the fake news issues that we have and the difficulty in determining what is truth, it's hard for me to even compare them. Uh, it, it's so different. I don't, I don't pretend to have any answers to, to the media mess that we're in today um, because I don't know who to believe. It's so difficult. You have to struggle. You know, my friends say, well, New York Times gets it right most of the time. Yeah, that's the New York Times that never got the Vietnam War right and got the WMDs wrong and didn't report on Ron Contra until everybody else in the world knew about it. But maybe, maybe that's the best we've got. You wanted to add? I think so. Um, were there other such uh, localized media? Well, he, right here in Champaign, we had the good old News Gazette, which was a, a, a stronghold of Republican uh, uh, strength throughout uh, the 60s. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I say that on the one hand, but then when I went back through the, uh, through the archives and, and looked for condemnation from uh, the News Gazette, didn't really see it. Even the News Gazette, they weren't paying that much attention. When the riot started, they certainly reported it, uh, but um, uh, there was a lot less of the extreme right-wing uh, ranting that I would have expected from them. There was, there was at the same time a, a second uh, newspaper based in Urbana, The Courier, which was a, of a more liberal nature. Um, and, and the way they reported the, um, the Holtz killing, uh, the Holtz murder, Edgar Holtz, the, the young black man who was shot in the back, is indicative. They, they, there was a, a series of columns from a, uh, a, an opinion writer, Bill Groninger, in The Courier, that took, took the city and the police department to task in, in great depth for, for their behavior. You wouldn't see that in the News Gazette. But you did see reporting of the riots. You saw the, you, you didn't, I was surprised at the less than extreme reporting of the student movement. You know, that's, I was talking about this with, with, uh, with, with a gentleman earlier today. As I, you know, I started writing this book, putting myself back in the shoes of a student protester of the 60s. But I got to tell you, the more I went through what, what was happening and the difficulties that people were, were faced with from an administration point of view, the more sympathetic I became to the administration. Now, I don't think they were perfect. I think they made a lot of mistakes. But they were caught between a conservative community on the one side a, re a Republican governor at, at, for, for m many of the years, and students who, who had very reasonable expectations. So there was no easy way out for them. I think they probably, I'm not sure if I'd been in their position, if I could have done any better than what they did. Yes? Can you say something about the nature of the media line that you're in the class that you're Yeah, and you know I haven't been repeating the questions, have I? It's okay. I'm supposed to, okay. Uh, the Daily Line I was a, was an award-winning student newspaper. Uh, I could not have told this story without the Daily Illini online records. Somehow, someone gave the, the Illini Media Company enough money to put uh, the Daily Illini online up until 1972, I think. I sure wish they'd kept going because it's a, it's a tremendous record. Uh, the Daily Illini at the time had some stellar uh, personnel. Roger Simon, who went on to uh, be a best-selling uh, uh, writer on the uh, New York Times, nonfiction writer on the New York Times bestseller list, and a founder of Politico. Roger Ebert, who was a, uh, uh, maybe the, the leading film critic in the country. Um, Balls, Dan Balls, who uh, went on to Newsweek and is still with the Washington Post. These were uh, one year after another after another. Bob Goldstein, who's uh, also quoted in the book, is uh, now a professor uh, in, uh, in Michigan. Uh, the, uh, the, the level of writing for a student newspaper at the time, I, I'm not in touch with it anymore, I can't think of any reason why it wouldn't still be as good, was top notch. It was excellent. Uh, you know, there were, there were goofy things and, and uh, uh, more typos than you'd like to see, but I think it was generally run as a, a, a very good, uh, media of record and uh, gave me a day by day by day accounting of what was going on on the campus. So it was top notch. Yes? 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I go into that a little bit in the book. I, I, I try to keep uh, opinion out of the book. I tried to write an objective history, but in the, the front material, she's asking about my personal life for the, for the listeners uh, and, and how I was affected by the times. But in the front of the book and in the conclusion of the book, I let my opinions come out. Um, the 70s were a difficult time for those of us who got out of school or coming of age at that time. It was an economic slump. Uh, the country was in a malaise, the war was ending, we had Watergate, uh, and it was hard to find jobs. But uh, after a while, it became clear that I needed to find a job. Uh, the revolution really wasn't going to come, after all, much too many people's disappointment, uh, and, uh, and I had to find a job. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I eventually found my way out. I taught school in Chicago for a couple of years. I eventually found my way to, uh, to Silicon Valley and worked in corporate America for most of my adult career. Um, in corporate America, you don't talk about politics. You don't talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, or politics. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm working and getting paid by Apple Computer, I'm there to sell Macintoshes, and when I'm working for Cisco, I'm there to help customers move their money to Cisco's pockets, and, and uh, anything that is deleterious to that goal is verboten. It's just unproductive. You don't talk about anything except you know, it doesn't mean there isn't water cooler talk and that sort of thing, but you don't get into serious talk. In fact, um, that is not just verboten, it is opposed to the core of what you're supposed to be doing and what you're getting paid for. It's not that they're opposed to it, it's, it's taking you away from the main goal of what you're supposed to be doing. So I spent, yeah, yeah, uh, making the company successful, making your team successful, making other people around you uh, successful, helping them get raises and get promotions and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so when I got out of corporate America in 2012 was when I started, well, first I had uh, the time and the interest, I had the time to reflect back. You know, that, that's, that's a treasure that we of a certain age have. Um, the, you know, the, the ability to look back, the time to look back and try to figure out what the heck happened and why it happened the way it happened. So that's the best answer I can give you off the top of my head. Yes, ma'am. Um, in, in whose interest is it that you say about the 60s and then stuff, 70s, 80s, et cetera, that there was no revolution? In whose interest is that? A lot of us did not go back into corporate America. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate being called out. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will try. By revolution, I was speaking specifically of fundamental political change, some sort of move toward the left, toward a socialist state or a social democracy or something that would be more to the benefit and con consistent with the interests of the people of the United States. What I've seen, my perspective, is that we've moved farther to the right uh, since the 60s with uh, with what I described as a neoliberal. Bernie Sanders, but that would have been a socialist That would have been. Excuse that would have been. That was, you know, you're, you're kind of erasing the, the contradictory profiles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've only got 30 minutes here, so I'm, I'm not going into great detail. If I finish the second book, I'll sure to, to, to bring in the ups and downs. But, uh, you know, I've only got 20 minutes and 10 slides to, to tell the story. But I don't, I, I, I admire your courage and your your um, uh, commitment to believing in, in political change. I, I believe in political change. I think this country's pretty screwed up right now. Uh, and I don't think it's Trump. I think Trump's just the, the tip of the iceberg. I think what our problem is much larger than Trump. Trump is just the latest fellow to take advantage of, uh, of, 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 of what's been going on for 40, 50 years. Um, I think we need fundamental political change. I'm all for it. Uh, I'm a little afraid of it, of how it's going to turn out, but I think we're headed toward it. I think that pendulum is swinging in your direction, in our direction. But I don't think, I don't think the fundamental political change happened. Are you going to write that book about the next steps of fundamental I got a couple of interviews this afternoon. <laughs>
And I'm gonna try to do it through the window of the University of Illinois, trying to look at the changes in the University of Illinois. How the heck did we get to the point where the state doesn't fund the university anymore? Where tuition and corporate grants fund the university? How did this happen? This is the I paid $300 a year for tuition. It's now $18,000 a year. Now, I, I, I talked to Eikenberry, the former president, wonderful fellow, very friendly. I, I said to him, on a spectrum of this happened, there were a bunch of bad guys who made this happen, or we just stumbled into this mess. He said, there was no strategy. The way we got to where we are today, it just happened. No one was thinking ahead. No one was trying to plan for how we would get to here. It just happened. I find that remarkable. Something's got to change. That can't go on. I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to be talking about the next book here. Yes, ma'am. the question. Uh, the question had to do with um, the children of today, the, those who have been born in the last 20, 30 years maybe, and how we might learn from what happened in the 60s and help them understand how to do better than we did. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't do well, I don't think. We, we, we faced a social, moral challenge, and we fought that that challenge, but the door was open to bigger battles that we, I personally did not take on. I went looking for a job, raised a family and paid a mortgage and tried to keep two dogs fed, that sort of thing. But a lot of people didn't. You know, this, I'll give you the example of this, this lady who asked the, the, the prior question. Those, those commitments to change, a lot of people stayed with it and, and they are the heroes I think that you should look to. You don't, I wouldn't look to people who, who gave up and uh, 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 went into corporate America for, for heroism. I, I think the heroism is the people who, like Bernie Sanders, who never, never gave up the fight and, and, and stayed with that fight. Uh, and there's a lot of them. It's, uh, it, it, it's not a small number. You know, people like Vern, uh, you can look at what Vern has done with his life in terms of uh, uh, setting up a food bank that feeds literally hundreds of thousands of people over the years. Uh, and there are, you know, and that's an interesting thing. I mentioned this toward, toward the end of the book. A lot of the people that I interviewed, a lot of people in the book, the 60s activists, turned into um, uh, social, uh, uh, turned toward careers of social uh, welfare, teachers, uh, uh, healthcare people, um, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, religious people, um, legal lawyers, uh, fighting for uh, uh, Berkey, who I mentioned here in the in the picture, uh, as the SDS leader, he was he, he was a um, lawyer in the um, uh, inland parts of uh, California, taking uh, fighting the good fight for uh, uh, lower socioeconomic people who don't have access to to, to uh, legal representation. Uh, we, had, uh, we had lawyers, so I think that there was a significant element of people that you can look to for mentoring and, and heroism. I don't claim to be one of those at all. Um, but I've got three kids who, uh, you know, 
I've got my hands full trying to point them in the right direction and, and keep them out of trouble. Uh, so I don't claim to be the, the mentor or hero that you should look to, but they're out there. And I named some of them in the book and uh, would encourage you to, to follow in, in their tracks. Yes, ma'am. UPTV. The story of Project 500. Thank you. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And I just want to ask you, why did you emphasize violence at the beginning? Because it wasn't really violent. So let me start by mentioning John Lee Johnson, who I did not identify when I put up the slide. 
uh, and, and his association with all of the uh, uh, good community organization work that was going on at the time and the links with, with the campus. So I apologize if you think I, I focus too much on the negative. That's what it sounds like your, your, your criticism is. I started with the violent stuff because I thought it was quite dramatic. I thought it would, I thought it would get people's attention and get, pull them into the book, to be perfectly honest. Um, but it was a violent time. I, 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 would, I, I would take issue that it wasn't a violent time, that, that in, in my mind, the violence was dominant. It's a, one of the major differences between today. People talk about how terrible today is, but body bags were coming back on a daily basis. Coffins were coming back. No, I don't mean the violence of the war. I mean the violence of the police, but I got the impression you were calling the movement against that a violent movement. No. Well, yeah. That's why I call the second phase, uh, or the third phase, the violent phase, to contrast it with, with, with what had gone before. Um, and and in, the, uh, in the civil rights era, you know, certainly it was the, uh, the Southern police and uh, uh, police shooting Black Panthers, that sort of thing. The violence was largely on, on one side. I, w I wasn't implying that, that it wasn't. But uh, I, you know, if, I, if we get a second uh, edition of the book, perhaps I can do a better job of interviewing people like you and the positive aspects of it. I've already, I've already got feedback from lots of people on things that I left out. Now, please read the book. You know, you don't, you don't have, I don't know if Julie's here, but you can go to the library and get it if, uh, if, if you don't want to buy it. But there's a lot more detail in there, and I think a lot of the positive stuff is in the book. Yes. Yes and no. So the question is about. Uh, yeah, I'll do my best. Let me address the north-south thing, because that's, that's, uh, that, that's something, one that I can get my head around. Um, the, um, that same difference existed back then, too, to some degree. Uh, north of campus didn't, didn't what, what was uh, much smaller than what we have today, uh, and, and I think is somewhat indicative of, of the growth of the university and, and worth studying. But I, I would point out in the student strike, the engineering campuses were largely shut down too. Uh, there, may have been, there may have been a uh, larger number of classes that were not. There may have been a, lar uh, a somewhat larger number of students that, that showed up for the engineering classes. As, as on the business classes, there was some analysis done of that. Uh, 
Uh, and as you'd expect, the strength of it came from liberal arts and humanities and, and that sort of thing. But it was a successful strike overall. Professors uh, shut down classes north of Green Street, just like they shut down classes south of Green Street. Uh, but I, I, I suspect that there's something there to what you're saying. The, uh, uh, there was, I, don't, I don't know enough about today's campus, but I would guess, and it's just a wild, wild ass guess, that um, the north of campus, just from looking at it, mu dominates much more today than it did then. There just wasn't, there, there were half a dozen engineering buildings uh, at, at that time, and there were you know, a lot more buildings over on, over on this side. So I think that that's probably an icon for the growth of what I call the neoliberal influence on, on, on the campus uh, over, over this time. Um, now with, uh, boy, with Silicon Valley, geez, we should probably go somewhere and have a long talk about that. But the, the, the connection between the West Coast uh, protest alternative uh, culture that to some degree found its way into the Silicon Valley ethos of Steve Jobs and, and the early founders, uh, that, in my humble opinion, having, having lived in that world, that's, that's, a, that's a cheap facade. Uh, the, I don't think there's a lot of there there. Uh, the people that run Apple Computer, the people that run Google are, are good old American capitalists looking to, looking to make every buck that they can make. And they may look hip and they may donate a lot to philanthropic causes uh, and, and they may even in some weird way think that they're making the world a better place. Uh, but uh, there's, there's, uh, there's a thin veneer of alternative uh, hyperbola uh, covering uh, a, a soul of capitalism. And yet it still manages to usurp the number of students who think of themselves as young graduates. Yeah. Think of themselves as young well, a lot of those young graduates were like me. They wanted to make a job. They, they wanted to uh, get a paycheck, and, and goodness knows Silicon Valley is a great place to get a paycheck these days. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Agreed. You're absolutely right. Thank you for, for adding that. Yes, sir. I just wanted to say that in terms of what some of these people were saying in terms of resources, if you make some work. Yes. Um, University Y right here was a hotbed of activity. Yes, it was. And all that was recorded on real to real tape and broadcast on WYLL. WYLL sent those recordings to the University of Archives. In 2009, Jack White got a American Archives grant. To look through that and see what we had over there in terms of student activism, civil rights, and a number of other categories. And there was incredible stuff. Dick Gregory gave the talk, um, Thurgood Marshall gave the talk. Wow. There, there were national leaders. And so some of that is, I believe, still on the WIL website. Thank you. He's got the records of what we found. Thank you. You know, writing a book, y y you spend forever on it, and you think you've got everything you can find. And like I said, the first three people that walk in here give me information that I didn't know about uh, oral, oral histories in the archives. And I spent a week in the archives and they didn't know about it. 
What's that? Hmm. But then he wrote a second book, and he talks about uh, Harper Livingston uh, being the person who was the primary person. Right. His son was later became the chief, you know, and everybody knows, you know, the old chief stuff. But uh, Red Range was actually at this midnight meeting that fired. Uh, it's in the book. Got that one. Yeah. yeah. Got that one. <laughs> Grange was a character. He ran nightclub. He was, he was a football hero in the 20s. Ran night, he dropped out of school when he lost his eligibility to play football. Ran nightclubs and then got picked for the Board of Trustees. Attended one meeting, put in the motion to fire George Stoddard. Never came back for another meeting. <laughs> Bill Dinsen. So I never said the 60s protest movement was a failure. I, I don't think it was a failure at all. I, th I think the effort to make fundamental political change in the United States of America, a revolution, if you will, failed. Uh, but I, I, I don't think of, the student pro I think of the student protest movement as a tremendous success. Again, kids, youth stopped a war. I can't think of any other example of that in history. 
That's a big deal. I'm serious about a statue. I, I think in October we ought to take up a collection for a statue. Uh, but I focus on that as a success. I, 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 I don't think that the fundamental political changes happened. Maybe I missed it. But, you know, we just went through two Bushes and an Iraq war and an Afghan war. We've got these endless wars going on. I think things are every bit as bad politically today, despite all the good things that, that Belden has talked about, that you've talked about, that Penny has talked about. There's a lot of great stuff going on. But we're not on top. I don't, I don't think we've been winning over the last 50 years. Uh, that's, that's just my opinion. And I, I'm glad to hear other people think more positively about the last 50 years. Maybe, maybe living in corporate America has done that to me. But maybe it looks better outside. And now that I'm outside, I look forward to, uh, to seeing that, that, that view more. Vern? Can you speak up, Vern? Second, what he said, and come back to uh, this gentleman. I was more hopeful about our political situation after writing this book than I've ever been before. What we did was tremendous. We had an extraordinary victory. We didn't win the whole war. The battle we won was huge. And it's enough, I think, if you read the book, it will give you hope that we can do more. So I'm, I'm, I'm with Vern that, that the 60s protest movement left after reflection. It felt like hell in 1970, 72. It felt like we lost. But looking back now, we won. A bunch of kids pulled off something really big. So I, I find it extremely hopeful. I have, I have friends who are incredibly depressed about today, and I ask them, I send them the, just the introduction and conclusion of my book. By the way, I recommend reading it that way. That's what you taught us in graduate school. You've got a book, read the introduction and, and the upfront stuff and, and, and the conclusion. I hope you come away with a feeling optimistic. I, and I wish Penny, I wish Penny was still here, but oh, you are. And you can, and I can say that to you, that I feel very optimistic about what happened with, with uh, the student protest movement. I want to say one more thing. I don't want to invite the fact that African Americans in the civil rights movement, which is the reason we have the courage to do that. They were 
Mayor's seat. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. 